and we're going to talk about climate and permaculture today and how how uh, how the permaculture movement can intersect with the climate movement. So this is Bill Mollison, uh, who co-founded permaculture with uh, David Holmgren. Uh, and this is uh, his quote from him. The aim is to, permaculture is the aim to create systems that are ecologically sound and economically viable, which provide for their own needs, do not exploit or pollute, and are therefore sustainable in the long term. Permaculture uses the inherent qualities of plants and animals combined with the natural characteristics of landscapes and structures to produce a life supporting system for city and country using the smallest practical area. And permaculture is a, is a design system and uh, it's, a, it's also a pattern language and it comprises a lot of uh, toolboxes, a toolbox for different solutions to a lot of the um, issues facing us. And uh, in terms of the climate, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's two different aspects to it. One is how can we uh, have more climate resiliency? That is how we can deal with the droughts, the heat waves, the floods, um, and the fires. And then climate restoration, which is how we can actually lessen some of this uh, droughts, fires, floods. Um, and so there's two aspects of this climate uh, movement. There's a lot of land atmospheric interactions. And so permaculture is looking to restore some of the, it's looking to guide us back to the natural way these land atmosphere interactions occur. And there's two, um, two primary ways that there's a lot of interaction. One is through the carbon and the, and the greenhouse emissions from the, from the land, um, which then creates uh, heating. And then some of that carbon comes back down uh, as the plants breathe it in. And then there's also the water cycle, which has to do with uh, the evaporation and evapotranspiration of water from plants, the soil, the oceans, and then as it comes back down in the form of rain. And, uh, and so if this cycle was restored, it can, it can, it can impact the drought, the, the flood, um, and extreme rain cycles. And also because as water evaporates, it actually also brings up heat. Um, it also shifts and cools some of the surface of the earth and brings some of the heat up into the atmosphere. So we'll be looking at how permaculture affects these two cycles and, and in the process uh, can help with climate restoration. So there's a, there's, there's a drought, fire, flood cycle that um, is, not, is not fully well known um, and it should be um, uh, similar to the story of the, the narrative of carbon emissions and greenhouse emissions causing the heating of the earth. This is also a very important uh, cycle that's that is happening around the world. So, um, so we have a lot of we have a lot of places. You'll see that there'll be huge fires, um, say like in Australia, and then like two years later. Now this year they've had like two years ago they had a huge fire, and then this year they're having huge floods. And um, and similarly, these things are happening all around the world, from South Africa to um, to Europe to North America that there's the, the, the fires are influencing the floods and the floods are influencing the fires and they're also influencing the drought. So why is this? Um, it's to do with, um, there's a lot of water draining off our continents and it, that affects the small water cycle, which then creates heat in the process, which then leads to fire. And then these fires, and I'll go into this in more depth. I'm just kind of laying out a little bit the larger scheme of things, uh, these fires, create problems because when you have really intense heat, the fire will, um, will actually create this waxy surface on top of the soil. And so that means that when huge rains come in the next year or two years later, they will not, they will not stick on the surface of the soil. And so then they'll create, they'll run off. And, and so instead of infiltrating into the soil and to the landscape, it actually runs off. And if downhill their cities, then it'll flood the cities. And also because the fires do take out a lot of the roots and the trees, um, and then people clear out a lot of this stuff, um, then th there's not as much uh, impediments to slow, to slow sink and spread the, the water as it comes in. And so you have these huge floods, and this is a picture of Australia um, early this year. So let's go into a little bit more how, um, why, 
why we're actually impacting the actual rain cycle itself. Um, so there's two cycles here um, that water goes in. It actually goes in from the ocean and it flows inland and then it flows out again. And then also the rain, as it goes down, it can actually, instead of flowing all the way out, it can infiltrate into the soil and the land and the ecosystem. And then later on get evaporated out again and then it goes back up. So it, instead of flowing all the way back out to the ocean, it actually just goes back up and comes back down. And it's actually a significant part of the cycle. So in this uh, diagram, you'll actually see that uh, the amount of water vapor flowing in from the ocean, this is in, uh, this is in just the huge units, but basically four of these units. And then um, the evapotranspiration is 73 of these units. And so you can actually see the amount of evapotranspiration is larger than the, uh, of the water coming from the ocean. So, so there's a tendency some people think that's only ocean water that's actually coming and causing rain, but actually a large part of it's actually coming from a small water cycle where the water's coming up from the evapotranspiration. And um, Milan Milan was a climatologist and he was, because Spain was losing its rain uh, over the decades. And so the Spanish government asked him to go examine what's going on. And what he found was that it was gradually losing its evapotranspiration because Spain was paving over its nature um, and so as you have concrete and asphalt over the, the, the nature, it evaporates, transpires less. And then also they were degrading the soil um, with, you know, with modern agricultural methods and, and other things they were doing to the soil. And so the soil was not able to absorb as much rain. And so the rain then would flow back out to the ocean. And so less evapotranspiration was happening and it needed both the ocean vapor and the evapotranspiration to create rain. And so we have a tendency to think, I mean, the, the mainstream media story about droughts is that it's just coming because of uh, uh, more heating from, from just the carbon emissions, but that's only part of the story. There's also, that's the carbon cycle, but there's also the water cycle and that's also a key part. And so we, we do have a lot of shortages of water around the world um, in, in California, here in California, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, like in LA right now, there's actually a, a, a limit on water usage because there's such a problem with the, the lack of rain. But this may have to do with actual how we're dealing with the land. And so this narrative needs to be told, and this is happening all around the world, as we kind of like chop down forests to create agriculture, and then the agriculture is destroying the soil and um, the, the various things we've, we've urbanized and, and, and agriculturalized the landscape. Then there's also a drying out of the land. And this story is also not being told. So basically uh, water comes inland, it's blown inland by the water, water vapor. And usually if the whole, we, you know, if we had a wild landscape, it'd be, the water would be absorbing the soil. It'd be going down to the aquifers and then coming back up in the rivers. And so it'd take longer to run out. But what's happened now is that we're, we're doing lots of things to this water. So a lot of the water in the wilderness is being piped to our agricultural agri centers and our urban centers. So in California, you know, a lot of water is being piped to Central Valley where all the farms are, which supplies a significant amount of food in America, and then also to LA and San Diego. And so in the process, you can imagine just draining that huge amount of water from the wilderness is gonna dry that all out. So there's gonna be a lot more fires there. And for some reason, it's a simple equation, but it's not also not being talked about very much. So um, industrial agriculture at the moment uses a huge amount of water and it drains it out with something called tile drainage. And, uh, and then it, so it funnels all this water from the wilderness and then it just drains it back out to the ocean. Okay. And then we've also incised a lot of the rivers. So it flows, so we've kind of created these channelized rivers so that it flows out even faster. And then um, our urban areas have, have, have these storm drains which drain the water out to the sea um, instead of like recycling it. And so, so we have to deal with these huge uh, drying out of our lands, which are leading to a lot of the drought and the heat problems, which then lead to the fire, which then lead to the floods. So here's an example um, of what tile drainage is. Um, and so in industrial farming systems, they'll actually, because they just, the soil needs just the right amount of water. Um, and so they'll constantly draining out the water and they'll put pipes underneath the, the, 
the soil and then they'll just drain that back out to the ocean. And so that, all that water is being lost. So what's the solution? Um, the solution is in, instead, to having, instead of having tile drainage is that we can actually improve the quality of the soil. So here on the left, you can actually see a picture of a flower. And then the, and so this is a, if the soil doesn't have much structure and then the flower can also turn into bread. And you can imagine pouring the water in the left side into the flower, it doesn't really absorb it very well, but if you pour it onto the bread, it will absorb it a lot better. And so we can really increase the organic content of our soil. And so that's what permaculture has a lot of tools for. Um, and that's why it's really important that we do spread the soil permaculture and other regenerative agriculture forms to the, the modern industrial agricultural farms. So soil is 20% water to 30% water usually. And so each increase of 1% of organic matter in the, in the soil will increase how much it can absorb the water by 5%. And so if we have this much healthier soil, then our soils um, will be able to hold a lot more water. We won't need to tile drain so much. And then also if we allow these farms to also be okay with having more wetlands and ponds on the area instead of just draining out the water. This will make a huge difference to the amount of uh, water we keep on the landscape. So here's, uh, so this is, where the, this is where the toolbox of permaculture really comes in useful. So there's lots of methods that can get propagated. So from compost teas to mycelial inoculation, companion planting, mulching, cover crops, hugel culture, vermiculture, and then perennials and annuals. So our current agriculture system just chops down a lot of the trees, but the, if we can keep the trees, they're also really important parts of the landscape. The tree roots help deal with erosion and then also help with evapotranspiration. They play multiple roles and, um, and also uh, slow down the wind. And then uh, earlier I talked about how a lot of our water that it funnels, it, we're piping it from the wilderness into our, our city centers, and then it just flows out, the stormwater drains out to the ocean. So that's a huge loss of the water. So if we're not gonna pipe all the water from the wilderness, then what we have to do is get our, our cities um, more water wise. And so this is, uh, so LA is finally starting to realize it. This is a huge, uh, they they're gonna depave a lot of concrete in Burbank, a, a town in LA and put in wetlands. And so these wetlands will then funnel the stormwater down and then they'll go into the aquifers. And so there's wood chips, biochar, a lot of the techniques that the permacultures, the permaculture world knows about, that because wetlands can naturally cleanse the water too. We don't need all these synthetic um, sewage systems and all this stuff. And so a cleanser would be stored underneath in the aquifers underneath LA, and that's a huge area. And so then they'll use the well to draw up the water. And so we don't have to lose, constantly lose, because LA actually, the rainwater provides a significant percentage of the, of the water that LA, that LA needs. Um, it doesn't need to be drawing so much water from Owens Valley and um, from the Colorado River and other places. And so if we kind of uh, use this permaculture toolkit and bring it, and in, there's a book by, I think, Toby Hemingway, The Permaculture City, and there's lots of techniques we can do in our cities that help capture the storm uh, water, including um, Brad Lancaster has uh, pioneered a way called the curb cut. So as the water flows down our, our roads, we can put little cuts in the, in the pavement, uh, in, the, in the street, so that the water flows off of it and into our gardens and into the you know, sidewalk of vegetation. And so um, he, he has a lot of, a, he has a water harvesting course. That a lot of these techniques can be very useful for helping our cities uh, to do better with our water cycle. So, um, and then China has actually pioneered a whole sponge city uh, process. And so these, these things, do well to keep the water on the land. So it helps with the, the, the drought cycle, but also in China, they did it also because of the flood, because the more the water is soaked up, it, it doesn't have to flood everywhere. So things like rain gardens, curb cuts, gray water, getting, uh, guiding the water from the, our gutters to the garden, from the rain gutters up on the roof, and then uh, putting little wetlands or ponds are all really useful. Um, and then, there's things that we can deal with, do with the floods, like so, like Pakistan just had huge floods, um, uh, and, and Australia earlier had this year, and so there's various things that were happening in in um, on the ground in Pakistan. There was a lot of deforestation, and so that that led to a lot more 
when the water, rainwater hits the ground, it doesn't get stopped by the, the forests. Instead, it just flows and floods more into the urban areas. Um, so what we're looking for is nature-based solutions. So um, what we can do is re reconnect up the rivers with the floodplains and uh, the floodplains can absorb a lot of the water. So our mo modern industrial methods are more, we use a lot of dams and levees. Um, um, and so the solution people are calling for in Pakistan, bigger dams and in Australia, bigger dams and more levees. But that, that's a problem because it's actually not allowing the natural water cycle. If we actually take down some of these levees and allow more of the land adjacent to be the wetlands, they, that's the natural buffer. And then the wetlands actually refill the aquifers and the aquifers can actually um, be a storage of water for the whole landscape. So even in dry season, the, the tree roots can go down in the aquifers and hydrate the whole landscape through a process called hydraulic redistribution. And so and that will also lessen fires. And so it help us get out of this fire flood cycle. Um, and then if we, in, in, again, in, improve the soil absorbency, then the water can seep into the, the wilderness instead of having to flood into the cities. Um, there's things you can do, uh, different techniques like chains of ponds. Um, and, and the whole sponge cities also helps deal with the floods. So again, there's a lot of permacultural solutions to the floods. Um, and, uh, and then with fires, like we want to hydrate the land more. And so there's all sorts of different techniques from swales to check dams to terraces. And if we can get the groundwater a higher level, higher level by funneling the water, by, there's a, a saying, slow it, sink it, spread it. And so sinking it down, and then you, the groundwater is brought back up by this process called hydraulic redistribution where the tree roots bring it up. And so that can help lower the amount of wildfires. So like in California, there's a lot of fire risks in Shasta area and Grass Valley. If we can get the neighborhoods to adopt a lot of permaculture techniques, go from neighbor to neighbor, say, okay, why don't you build swales, terraces, um, improve the soil quality, like, and all the neighbors get together. It can be quite useful to help. It's a different approach to dealing with wildfires instead of just, the current approach is just to clear out brush and thin trees, which then also creates a lot of problem because it's uh, lessening the amount of, vegetation we have. And then the other thing that's uh, really powerful as we kind of permaculture the landscape is that um, you can see here when it's degraded, there's a lot more uh, heat re-radiated. And so here's a picture of the same piece of land either degraded or permaculturally you know, restored. And so it's 30, 35 degrees Celsius when it's degraded because the bare soil is just very, bare land is very hot. And if, the, if there's a lot more water in the landscape, then the landscape is only 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit or 95 Fahrenheit. And so there's a, there's a lot of usage of having more vegetation on a landscape because it'll help shift the heat up in Because the water particles, when they evaporate, it's kind of like when you sweat, you perspire. And so that cools your skin. Or well, in the same way, the earth's skin is also cooling. So it's kind of a key thing and, uh, and also this is a narrative that really should be talked a lot more about in the global warming um, is that there's a process that can really cool. So we're shifting the heat up higher, but, uh, but it, it does allow all the animals and the way we live on the surface to be a lot cooler. So how, how can we, so one of the key things is we need to do a big shift, like, because the ag industrial agriculture, I don't, and that narrative is not being told that industrial agriculture is causing a lot of the fires and the floods, like the cycle. So we need to do a mass shift. Um, and the industrial agriculture will absorb a lot of carbon. In fact, if we could convert the world's agricultural lands all to permaculture, that would actually count for a significant, maybe even all the carbon emissions right now. Um, and also it would help really restore the water cycle and hydrate the land. Um, and uh, permaculture can actually grow more food. The thing with permaculture though, is that it is more intensive because you actually have to pay attention to all the details um, and you actually have to be on the land. You have to, it also requires a, a deeper connection with the land. So you have to be constantly observing, interacting and figuring out the feedback loops. So that's where we need to train a lot more people in permaculture. And so like, if we can get a lot more people in the PDCs and, and, and show that this is a path to dealing with the climate work, 
So the, there's about 1% of people in the US in agriculture now. There used to be more like 10% in the 1950s. If we can get it back up to the 10%, people doing permaculture, that would be about the right number um, to actually do a huge shift um, so that we can actually shift uh, our lands to a lot more permaculture. Um, and then it's it, a lot of the climate work is, should be working at the local levels. And permaculture is good because it's created a lot of bioregional groups. Um, and we can also have water councils. And so if we create a network of these bioregional groups and water networks um, and understand how they're all connected to each other, because the water evaporating from one neighborhood actually can bring land inland. And so you're affecting the rains further inland and also the water flowing downstream. Um, so what you do upstream affects the water downstream. So there's a way they're also interconnected. And so if we can activate and really activate these bioregional groups to do a lot of permaculture actions. Um, will have quite an effect on the water cycle and help through its various processes have an impact, impact on fire, floods, droughts, and heat. Um, so earth care, um, uh, so there's three permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share. So earth care, there's a natural extension into climate permaculture. People care has been about social permaculture and fair share has extended in this idea called financial permaculture, which has to do with localization of economics, the commons and multiple financial streams. How do we funnel money into this, um, into this uh, permaculture uh, sector of the economy? And then transition towns came out of a permaculture teacher's attempts to actually get the town to deal with energy descent and lower our carbon usage and, and energy usage. And so the transition towns is a kind of this example of a bioregional approach to permaculture. And so I think, that is another way that we can actually get a lot of permaculture action is organizing around transition towns and bioregional groups. And, uh, and in the transition towns, we can actually work with local government. There's a tendency in permaculture to be a little bit anarchist, but I think it can also work with government and, um, and transition towns have done a lot of work with local governments. And that's where the social permaculture techniques of facilitation and working with communities can be really useful. It's how to bring different sectors together and talk about it. And at that level, we can do a lot of work at the local government level. We can deal with land, dams and levees and switch to more wetland system. And we can get you know, the, the county areas to regenerate the soil. We can also transition away from this drainage paradigm where we're constantly funneling water out to the ocean and instead reuse our storm waters. Um, it can help, help the shift from the industrial ag to the permaculture and can also help with financing. So I have a question, if I might. Um, one of the yes. things that I haven't heard in this conversation, except just, I think, one phrase, is really the role of trees and forests in the water cycle and how important that is. I think that's the story also that's not told much. So I'm wondering, is that part of the natural permaculture story, or is that coming in from another place? Oh, yeah, it's definitely part of the permaculture. In fact, Permaculture, in the, especially in the beginning, they really emphasize perennials over annual, like it's not just annuals because our agricultural, perennials meaning they, they emphasize having trees in the agricultural system. And so we shouldn't necessarily chop down all the trees just to create agricultural farmland. And yes, and then talk about food forests, which is a way of uh, using trees and permaculture definitely talks a lot about trees. I mean, trees create rain actually. If you... Yeah, yeah, thank you for presenting. Yeah, so the trees, um, they also emit a certain bacteria that can float into the sky and actually can seed rain. Um, it's called yep. bioprecipitation. And so, um, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a theory called biotic pump, uh, which mm -hmm. is a bit debated, but it also says that the trees can potentially draw in the water as the water condenses over the forest. <laughs> ah, thank you, Hannah. Yeah, this is a great book. I'll put it in the chat right now, but really goes into the science behind how trees not only help create rain, but help cool the soil and the planet and tie into the water cycle and everything.